All right, we're live. This is Dallas Winston of BloodyElbow.com. We're doing kind of a one-off show today, a catch-up with an old buddy of mine. It's uh, MMA's Dirk Diggler. Say hello, Dirk. <laughs> hey, guys. How are you? <laughs> That's, of course, in reference to Mr. Josh Saman's freshly flowing locks. You just going, just new look that you're going with? or Boogie nights, baby. Boogie nights. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Josh and I are uh, just going to kind of shoot the breeze for a little bit here, and we got a couple topics in mind. Uh, his friend and training partner, Luis Palomino, the baboon, is fighting in the headliner of tonight's World Series of Fighting 12. So we're going to touch on that briefly, but we're going to go a little more in depth on Josh and his kind of immediate fighting future. And uh, we're going to lead off with uh, some talk on this uh, freshly boiling rivalry between John Jones and Daniel Cormier. Um, Josh, of course, uh, trained and competed on the Ultimate Fighter under John Jones as a coach. So um, why don't we start off, just kind of give me y your overall thoughts on, on this beef between John and Mr. Cormier. Um. Well, you know, I think a lot of the a lot of the talk and speculation most recently has just come down to the the immediate question of whether or not this whole brawl thing is good for MMA. Uh, and and you know, there are those like Joe Rogan and you know a few others who have said no. But it seemed like most of the staff at Bloody Elbow as well as me agree that overall this is just a you know. The, I mean, when when viewers and fans and casual fans and mainstream people look at this, they're just going to think, oh, it's a, you know, they're two fighters fighting, big you know, big fucking deal. Um, and, I, and I don't think there's going to be any really negative repercussions for it. If anything, I've seen more uh, coverage of the sport and more coverage of this particular uh, UFC event than any UFC event in recent history, you know, if, if at all, um, you know, it's all over ESPN, all over every single sports network. All my friends that don't aren't, you know, aren't huge followers of MMA are talking about it. And, um, and I'm intrigued by it as well. Uh, I've been watching Cormier for a long time, even when he was a, uh, you know, strike force heavyweight champ. And there was always talk of him possibly going down to 205. And, and, and that's what I, you know, obviously I'm not his coach or anybody like that. That's what I thought he should have done is, is, you know, go down there, Try his best there. Uh, you know, I know obviously there were some weight cutting things that he was worried about, but he got that. You know, he, he made 205 when he fought Cummins, and um, and, I, and I'm sure he'll make it again for the title fight. But I always viewed Cormier as the biggest threat to John Jones' championship. Um, I, I, I there's so many different factors at play that we don't know. Um, but so the, I'm looking at the odds right now, and the odds uh, are one and a half to one. You know, Cormier is the underdog here. And uh, I'm not sure that should be the case. I just don't know. I don't. I mean, I I, I I'm rooting for John. I want John to win. Uh, I'd be lying if I said we were close. But we're you know we hang out a little bit when we see each other. I think dominant champions are good for the sport. Uh, overall, I'd, I'd like to see John win. But man, it's going to be a tough fight. I mean, you're talking about a guy who fought at heavyweight, fought. Let's run through this list. Antonio Silva knocked him out. Jeff Monson was obviously, you know, his first real test. Josh Barnett threw him around like a girl. Beat Frank Mir. Beat Roy Nelson. You know, did things to Dan Henderson that we didn't think could be done to Dan Henderson. Um, he's fought really tough guys at really heavy weights and, uh, and, and light heavyweight, and, uh, and, and we've never seen him lose a round. To my knowledge or, uh, or memory, I don't, I don't think he's lost a round at one single round in his whole career, has he? Not that I can think of right now, no. Yeah, and he's kind of yes. like the perfect animal, too, wouldn't you say? He is the perfect wrestle boxer, I think. I think that I don't think anybody in MMA can possibly. I, you could get a freaking eight year old kid right now and have him on the wrestling mat for the next 20 years, and I still don't, I'm not sure that he can catch up with Daniel Cormier's wrestling. And, uh,. And his boxing is great. His boxing is, is stellar. He's got good, hard, crisp punches, pretty good defense. Um, you know, I'll say that I think that Jones is under his skin a little bit, but I don't. I think I think it's kind of easy to get under Cormier's skin from what we've seen lately. If you guys remember, he pushed Patrick Cummins at the weigh-ins too. Cummins didn't come back and <laughs> attack his ass <laughs> afterwards like Jones did. Why but, uh, but yeah, yeah, wisely exactly because he probably would have got cut. Um, but. Um, just because you're under someone's skin doesn't doesn't mean that they're going to lose the fight by any means. You know, I think that that's probably an emotion that uh, Cormier takes into the cage and uses pretty well. So he definitely looks flustered. He looks frustrated when they're doing these interviews and he's having to interact with Jones. Um, you know, he 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 looks frustrated for sure. If if somebody's under somebody's skin, it sounds like John's under Cormier's skin. That's not to, that, that that doesn't have anything to do with the outcome of the fight. I think. 
So let me try to just fire off some basic comments or, or questions based on everything you just said, and I'll start at the beginning with the you know the brawl and and whether or not it's it's bad for the sport. And you must have read. I, actually, I didn't even read it. The Bloody Elbow Roundtable, where we all commented on whether yeah. or not that was kind of a. So this is kind of a, a revisitation of what I said there. But to me, the term "bad for the sport" harkens back to the time when MMA was not mainstream, and it was the mirror image of those saying support the sport. It was people saying MMA is one of the greatest sports on earth. Kind of how we, how we still look at it, and many others view it now. But it, it just wasn't mainstream, and it was a time where I think it was extremely susceptible to just being painted with, these guys are a bunch of thugs and criminals, and oh look, see, they, they have a way in, and they can't even you know, refrain yeah. themselves from, from throwing hands while they're there. Sorry, hold yeah. on a minute, i got some screen bullshit popping up on my computer here. So to me, uh, the way MMA is now... I don't think we have to worry about that. Wouldn't you say that MMA has come to a level where we don't really have to be, you know, just I, like I, in any other sport, you know? It, yeah. It's in a, yeah that, it's, go ahead. You no, know, no, and I'm, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but you're no, exactly you're right. Is, is, there's, is, is MMA, I think, now is at a point to where it's solidified itself enough in the eyes of the mainstream viewers, and it's being covered on, uh, on, on national television, and it's on all the sports networks, and it's not, it's not taboo. It's not fringe like it was... 10, 20 years ago. Um, so, and, and you see, there's, I mean, look at baseball, look at basketball. I mean, I mean, every time, which doesn't happen often, but every time that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, uh, a batter rushes the mound or, or two basketball players get pissed and throw a silly ass punch at each other. I mean, it's, no one's crying. It's going to be the end of, of basketball or baseball. I mean, they may say that it's bad for it, but whatever, it's in the news for the week. And if anything, it makes people watch more. Um, and that's what you're trying to capture in sports in, in general and in MMA especially is emotion and and and, and the, it looked it looked uh, what happened at the at the you know at the face off at the press conference on uh, Monday it looked genuine to me you know I don't think people were saying is it staged yada 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 I don't think it was staged at all I think those two guys really don't like each other and I think emotions ran high and that's what you want is you want emotions in sports. If it was staged, it was extremely well acted by by all parties because because you could see the one UFC cat who tried to and actually credit to that guy because Dave he did. Yeah. He did the, I'm going to step in. Whoa, okay, I'm going to get out of the way. I mean, he committed and he hung with it, and that is no. one place on earth I would not want to be right in between a pissed well, off John Jones and. Well, Dave. not not only that, but if it was staged, I don't think they would have staged it to the extent of knocking over the whole freaking stage itself, Jones being on top of Cormier, raining down his giant 85-inch long-reach punch. You don't, you wouldn't stage that to that extent, you know. So I think it was real. So r random observation, but one thing that I think would maybe increase the risk that it could give a black eye to the sport is that UFC backdrop thing topples over and falls on some old lady in a wheelchair that was sitting back there. You know what I mean? Yeah, and or Jones is... Eye gets cut open, or, or or Cormier's knee gets tweaked during the thing. That would have been terrible. It would have been awful, you know. But it and I'm glad, yeah, and I was gonna say I wasn't necessarily joking when I said that, even though it was a little bit of an extreme example. But in this case, I think it would take a little bit more of an extreme example to for one singular incident to have a bad impact on the sport. And as yeah. long as this remains the exception to the norm in place, <laughs> I do not really give a shit about stuff like this. I don't really like the idea that any publicity is good publicity either because that's, I don't know, maybe immoral yeah. or, or I don't know. But at the same token, I think we both agree this was not a big deal whatsoever. Listen, and a, a perfect example of uh, that, uh, that disproves that any publicity is good publicity is look at Josh Grisby right now. That, he, hey, <laughs> you don't want that kind of publicity. That guy, oh, man, he's got no – his world just seems to be crumbling around him right now, and rightfully so because if everything that's going on is true. So, no, not all good publicity is good publicity. But like you said, as long as this remains an exception to the rule and, you know, just – if, if it happens often, then the sport, then, then ESPN and these sports companies will stop covering it. It'll stop being a big, you know, big deal, and uh, and eventually, yeah, that'll be, you know, that that we don't want that to become the standard, pretty much. So yeah, for those who aren't aware of the Josh Grisby story, that was uh, some home abuse, beating on his wife, and also some weird things where he would like train his dog to attack her, and yeah, the dog so did. So that's what we heard the last couple of days, and then today I think was the most recent thing that I read where some text messages were leaked, some really graphic, vulgar, 
you know, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to let my dog kill you. Crazy shit. Really, really crazy shit. So, uh, yeah, it's a good thing that guy's out of the UFC. Yeah, and I think they found guns, marijuana plants, and cocaine. Mm -hmm. and you know you're going really far. <clears throat> I was a little offended that he made cocaine and marijuana even look poorly. And you know you're doing <laughs> You know, you know you've gone over the line at them. Like, come on now. It's oh, not... he's crossed the line for sure. <laughs> All right, so um, let's move on from that. Now, um, be remind me to come back. I do want to do a little bit of kind of like a technical breakdown on Jones Cormier. But first, give me your thoughts on, uh, I, I guess, share with us some your experience training under John on The Ultimate Fighter. And, of course, I'm not looking for you to, was he a dick or anything like that. Just overall how do, how he did as a coach and then what you could kind of absorb from his personality you know was he nice and humble because he's kind of been both in the media he's been the evil bad guy and he's been like a real classy guy what was your impression no he was great he was, he was really cool and then uh Chel Sonnen is one of my favorite fighters and uh when they announced the coaches you know, I wanted to be on Chael's team I'm in the long run I'm glad I was on Jones's team I had a, I have a great bond with the, the team that I, that I was on. We had great assistant coaches, and Jones was really cool. Um, it, it, he he kind of let his assistant coaches do the the technical coaching, but he was there as a figurehead and as a motivator. And he always always had really good motivational stuff that you know, um, find a way, find a way. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. He had all these things, these mantras that I'm sure he had learned through wrestling grow up that growing up that uh that, that 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 he tried to you know try to try to teach us and stuff. And I mean, you gotta understand he's the same age as I am. He's younger than most of the guys that were on the show. So and he knew that. Um, so you know, he he was a good coach. I'm glad I was on his team. And uh, and in terms of of what you said about his this kind of the split personality thing he's got going on. I mean, Chael had the same thing going on, you know, with, to, to a, a different degree um, and a different context. But but I think Jones, you know, everyone says he's embracing the heel, blah, blah, blah. I think that's a cliche term. I don't like that term. Um, but uh, but what he's doing is he's realizing that, that it's okay sometimes to be the cocky asshole champion. But then there are other times where you need to be the guy who's sponsored by Nike and Gatorade. And those are the times that you're on ESPN, you know, that the most viewers are watching. That's when you need to set a good example for the sport, et cetera. But, but there are times where you can, you can be yourself, you know. And I think John has realized that, and he's kind of learning, um, you know, when exactly to, to play each part. To me, that's always weird that people focus on that because it isn't like every human being like that. You have some days where you're an asshole, some days where you're yeah. a good guy. You're not just yeah. one or the other based on one instance. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But but to the extent that he took it to where like five minutes before his ESPN interview, he's on Twitter talking shit, <laughs> and then he's on there in the in the in the fucking schoolgirl voice. This shit was hilarious, man. But he but he's he's playing the game, dude. He's doing it well. I, I like it. I like it. So that was interesting what you said about him coaching. It sounded like he was more of a conceptual coach rather than hardcore technique. This is how you, you know, walk through yeah. the steps of a that, – yeah. that's actually pretty cool. One more question on his coaching. Well, first, a question before that question. I think right now that it, it's not even close. John Jones is the most creative innovator, not only in MMA right now, but in MMA history. Agree or disagree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just the – Shit, we saw it in the Stephen Barner fight. He started those spinning back elbows. People have tried it with mixed success since then. Um, you know, he's got some. He's got some tools in the arsenal that that a lot of other people haven't really had the confidence or creativity to throw, and he does it. And uh, and and hopefully he continues to do it. That arm wrench that he did on Glover. You know, it's. It, I mean, he, that's what I like in fights is people who are trying to hurt you at any cost, um, because that's what our sport's about is is about violence. And uh, and, and John has a, a great great capacity for violence. Would you? I mean, it's sportsmanlike violence, though. I mean, right? Because you can't say it's just about violence. Because when the bell when, when the bell rings, the bell rings. You know, and he is. I mean, the 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 um, what what is considered sportsmanlike, I think, kind of falls around the framework of the rules. And if if there's not a rule that says you can't throw that oblique kick, as they call it, that downward kick on the leg, then why, why would you not? If you don't like it, change the fucking rules. You know, I mean, there's, I mean, obviously the eye pokes are something else altogether. And he's even been in a recent interview acknowledging those, saying that he's working on those. And, and that is something that long people do is, you know, long fighters will put their arm out there and kind of gauge range a little bit, whereas a short fighter doesn't have that luxury. He's got to come in and throw some 
some heavy leather, and he and he's not, you know, it, it's a different game for different fighters. So I think it kind of plays into that a little bit. But he needs to close his hands. You know, the last thing we want to do is see. His, I'm sure he won't get DQ'd. You know, but but to see a point taken away or something like that and change and change the outcome of a fight because of that and see him possibly lose a fight that he would have otherwise won if he just would have kept his hands closed. That's the worst case scenario in my mind. All right, remind me to come back to the eye poke thing because I want to keep with whatever's left of my original question flow. So and it, it's going back to his creativity. He never really had a chance to impart because if I were a fighter, I would want to tap into his brain and, and try to just learn more about how he comes up with... And to me, when you brought up Stefan Bonner, it was the fight before Andre Guzmao. And to me, it's it's like the archetypal John Jones creativity move. It was when he... I mean, changed levels all the way down to the floor, went for a low single. As soon as Guzmao reacted, he he came up high and spun yeah. at the same time and threw a spinning back fist. That's so, fucking phenomenal. It is, but all right, so to give you a little more uh, insight into that is is – I'm sure 90% of it is Jones's creativity, and like I said, his confidence to throw it I think is the most important thing. But there was an assistant coach that John had brought onto the show. Uh, There's a Native American guy named Stonehorse, and I don't know if anyone even knows who he is besides us and the people that grew up with John. Um, but that was apparently Jones's first striking coach, and he used to teach us some crazy shit that we were all like, we're not doing that in the fight, bro. <laughs> examples. Examples. <laughs> Give me no, like a couple of like. Give me, I'm, I, you know, I'm fascinated by a move a coach would show you that you would say no fucking way, man. To be honest, we that's a better question for Dylan Andrews. Dylan and Stonehorse really hit it off, and we would just watch them hit pads sometimes, and uh, and we would just be dumbfounded. But uh, anyway, Stonehorse had some really creative things uh, that he would try to try to you know try to teach us and stuff. And I think pretty much what happened is Stonehorse came across John Jones, you know, the super athletic, confident. Uh, guy and 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 he taught him some, some you know I don't know I don't know how much of the moves are stone horses how much of them are John's but I know that John really looked up to this guy a lot and he brought him on the show for a reason and um, and uh, hopefully hopefully you guys will see some more stone horse someday he was a really funny character but they didn't show him much on the show now that, now that you mentioned him and Dylan I remember him really well because I really liked kind of it sounds corny but the bond that they had it really kind of made me like Dylan as well oh yeah they had a great bond. So now let me go back to the eye poke thing, and, and this is more of a question for you as a fighter. To me, with the eye poking thing, it's not, I would say 90% of the time it's not malicious. I would even say more, but someone argued with me that, how would you know? So whatever. But to me, the, the eye poking thing, when you're either reaching out or pushing someone away, and also when someone is ready to take you down and you're about to fall over, I think it's inherent in your in the fabric of being a human to reach out and grab something and try to stay upright and then yeah that's the same way as people grab cages you know it, and so how isn't that how, uh, do you have to, it would seem to me that you would have to make a conscious attempt in training to avoid I can see the open finger thing but uh, you know when you get taken down it's it, 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 I guess what I'm saying is it would almost seem like a waste of time to spend so much of your effort and energy into not committing a, a foul because it's almost just like natural human instinct. Does that question make sense? So you're saying that he should he should just stick with the foul and keep poking people in the eye? <laughs> no, no, not at all. But see, I want to say within the last year, only recently the eye poke thing has become a big deal. Before that, people still held their arms outstretched. You know, it's like a normal in, in a fight if you're gauging yeah. distance or, or, or whatever. Um, I, I guess to me, it, it seems like my point is, I don't think there's anything we can do to completely banish or eliminate a lot of those things. Just until me. they until they change the, you know, I, I haven't tried the new Everlast gloves on or whatever. Until they change the glove, where if you do put a glove on and you you know you put an MMA glove on, that padding right there doesn't have any natural arch on it. It's straight. So the way that it makes your hand is straight. We need uh, we need a glove. That when your hand is relaxed, instead of like this, it's like this. And once we come to that point to where uh, there's a little bit of arch on it and it's pushing your fingers down that way, then we can say that this person who's poking people in the eye is doing it with malicious intent. I mean, they're doing it intentionally because the way the relaxed hand, this is how your hand should be when it's relaxed. And if you have a glove that's doing that and your fingers are still like that, then you know it's intentional. You know, So until they change the glove effectively, I, I'm not sure there's much we can do about it. 
Hasn't the concern about that historically been that then it's unfair for a grappler because he wants to keep his hand wide open to grab a limb, whatever, that it would then in, uh, prohibit the grap the grappler? Who cares about grapplers? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the fair answer I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's wrap up this Jones-Cormier thing with a little talk on, on the matchup. And to me, the thing that's most interesting is John has become known as a bit of a wrestler killer. You know, I think everyone was dumbfounded by the way he performed against really reputable and legit wrestlers. Kale, Ryan Bader, uh, who else? I mean, I mean, Laddie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so either way, he's been without necessary, well, unquestionably without the credentials of Cormier. Um, how do you think? Let's just say these two lock up in a clinch. Uh, I'm under the impression that Jones, uh, his length, that's one spot that might actually work against him. If Daniel Cormier can get in close range and especially get a body lock, I'm thinking his height and noodly, you know, limbs might be a little bit of a disadvantage. It's kind of a shaky game plan for the tall guy to say, okay, stay away, stick and move, and the short guy to say, okay, let's get in and take him down. But I, but I mean, if Jones... I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. Who knows what Greg Jackson's going over with John Jones right now? And I'm sure they have some game plan to counteract the Olympic level wrestling of Daniel Cormier. But I think if Daniel Cormier gets a body lock on anybody in the world walking this planet, he's going to be sending them flying. I don't care how good they are at fighting, how good their balance is, how heavy they are. I don't care about any of that stuff. I think if, if Cormier gets his hands connected around you, you're going flying. Um, that being said, yeah, we've seen John do some some great things against some great wrestlers, and maybe he can maybe he can get in a tie clinch and show us you know show us some knees, show, show us some things that we haven't seen before, which he does every fight, you know. So that's not it's not uh, you know it's not um, it wouldn't be a surprise if we did see something new from John, especially in the clinch where I think he's in the most danger. Um, but but yeah, to answer your question, when the two lock up, I think the advantage goes to Cormier. So then that goes to how the, you know, I guess the other important aspect of the fight, which is free movement striking, you know, when they're out in open space. And to me, the, the, the I mean, exponential advantage that Cormier will have over the other wrestlers that Jones has faced is his agility and his footwork. The dude is quick. He uses short little knifing steps. He moves his head on the way in. He uses angles. I'm not saying that's going to be the key and that's why he's going to beat him, but that, you know, an Olympic wrestler with probably the best entries and footwork that John Jones has faced, to me, uh, is going to make it a real big, big test for him. It is, man. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing that complements Cormier's wrestling is his striking. Uh, it's mostly his boxing. I mean, he throws some kicks and stuff, and uh, the distance, the uh, you know, that that distance striking, that free range of motion. Um, I think that'll be I think that'll be Jones's ticket as long as he as long as he doesn't get clocked too many times. You know, like I said, we we've seen Jones, uh, we've seen not hurt, but we've seen him punched more than we've seen Daniel Cormier. You know, Gustafsson found you know found not not necessarily his chin, but he found his face a few times. And I would consider Cormier to be a better striker than Gustafsson is. Um, so we can only assume that, that Daniel will as well. But uh, I think the free range of motion uh, aspect of the fight goes to Jones. Hmm. So why don't you come back and join us whenever we do our Vivis section, breaking down that card, if not the the card, at least for that one fight you game for Yeah, that? absolutely. For sure. Cool, cool. So uh, let's move on to uh, <coughs> Luis Palomino, who's fighting in the headliner tonight. Um, yeah. Probably Tomorrow. Tomorrow. What, what day is today? Friday. We, is this Earth? <laughs> it's is tomorrow it tomorrow? In Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad I didn't reschedule you. Then all of a sudden, my night just opened wide open. <laughs> Calendars, man. Who would have thought to check the fucking calendar about something like uh, that? Not <laughs> you. <laughs> this whole show is a success, man. Josh Salmon, Saman, my bad. Just freed up my my Friday evening, so this is a winner wow. for sure. Good yeah. news. Wow. A lot of possibilities. So, anyways, there's a, there's a time that I called him really underrated, and he is that, but to me, this guy is more of the consummate spoiler. I want to say that there's two guys, Masvidal and someone else, who were, ha oh, I think it was Jay-Z, were having a rough time and look to kind of get, you know, what you would call a tune-up fight, and they fight oh, Palomino, yeah. which has got to be the worst decision in the world, man, because he can hang with, with top-level fighters. He just hasn't h strung together enough wins, I think, to be recognized as one. Agree this no, you hit the nail on the head, and that's really the story of Baboon's career. Is um, so 
you know, Palomino, this is a guy I grew up watching. I'm I'm 26 now. Baboon is four or five years older than me, and and so when I was growing up on the on the regional scene, you know fighting on undercards and stuff still, Baboon was always at the top of the card. He was always the guy that all of us looked up to before I even knew him personally. And, um, dude, he just used to kill people, man. He's just got such great striking, and he's just a really, um, you know, he's a, he's a pretty charismatic dude as well. So I think he's got all the makings to be a star. But like you said, he's just got to string together the wins. And and that's what that's what's happened multiple times. He's He, he knocked out Cavalcante. He knocked out Derek uh, Cruikshank. Uh, you know, he beat Masvidal. Um I think that I think Baboon is one of the best 55ers in the world. I'm not just saying that because he's my teammate. You have to look at his track record. But to be honest, I think he should be fighting at 145. But you know his speed at 155 really kind of does him well. Um, but he's beat the last guy I beat, Patino, for example. Uh, that, that that guy knocked out Jacare like years ago, like the 185 middleweight contender Jacare. So I mean, there, you do you look at you look at uh, you look at Baboon's uh, record and, and everything. That's pretty much what it is. Three or four beast ass wins. And then something will happen. He'll lose a decision or something. So uh, this is a guy who um, really is one of the one of the leaders of the team where I train at MMA Masters. Um, he's he's uh, he's uh, Ricardo Lamas's uh, main training partner when he comes down to Miami, and, and, and he's his main training partner for a reason. They push each other, you know, in the same way that Aldo and, and Lamas pushed each other in their own fight. I mean, you gotta you gotta understand that these guys are uh, man. These these are these. Baboon's good. Watch Saturday, and you guys will all be impressed by Baboon, and, and, and the world will know who he is soon enough. Well, yeah, and of course, when you mentioned Makako, that guy's a fucking Valley Valley Tudo legend. I mean, that's Hor you know Jorge yeah. Tino back from yeah. the day, uh, knocked out Jacare really, really early in his career, but some legendary matches. And now, you know, Makako Gold Team, he's coaching and training a lot of present day UFC fighters. So, um, just I guess in case you did seem biased with Baboon being your friend and teammate, honest question: Why, why do you think he's not a top level fighter? What do you think is held him from being widely recognized as one of the elite? Uh, opportunity and platform mostly, you know. But if you want that opportunity and platform, you got to string together the wins and you got to get on the big stage. Uh, I think he's got a few more fights left with World Series, and uh, I don't want to speculate on his contract or what his plans are after that or anything. But um, he's—I mean—they gave him the main event slot for this weekend, and uh, man, are we excited about it? As you should be, man. It's a good <laughs> shot. How, how old is he? He's early thirties. I think he's thirty-one. All right, so yeah, I mean, yeah, he's got time. He's got plenty of time for sure. Sure. Clock's sure. ticking. It's not like he can, you know, take a couple years off or wait or whatever, but definitely uh, has several years to to keep at it and get that shot. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So that's uh, World Series of Fighting 12 tomorrow, not tonight. Tomorrow. It's not tonight. So everybody check that out. And uh, yours truly, I'll be doing play by play for that event. Um, let's now move on and then close with you, your, yourself. Tell me, um, you know, what you what what's next on the table for you in your fighting career? Oh man. Um, well, I called out Dan Miller. I heard he was coming back. I heard he wanted to fight uh, in October, and this was about this was about a month ago, and I was about to get my letter uh, of clearance from my doctor. There's been so much shit happening in my life in the last year, in the last 18 months, that has just uh, set me back, and I'm ready to go on. I've had, I've had some personal losses. Um, I've had two surgeries. I mean, there's literally not much more you could put a person through over the course of a year, 18 months, that will motivate him more than I've been motivated right now. So I wanted to fight Dan. Um, I don't think the UFC was very interested in that fight, uh, and I wanted to fight in October. Um, my mom's husband just died about a week or two ago. Really huge tragedy. Came out of came out of nowhere. They were living together, and uh, you know, I don't want to go too much into that, but. Um, for those of you who don't know, last year I lost my, you know, I had this, I had a, uh, uh, you know, a girl that I was in love with and I thought I'd spend the rest of my life with and, and she died as well. So right now I'm watching my mom go through the same thing that I went through over the last year. So it's pretty hard. So I, I you know, I want to do whatever I can to help her out and, um, and, uh, I think it's best to take another month or so off, um, and, uh, and come back strong, and uh, so I've asked the UFC to fight on December 6th, which is Haley's birthday. It'll be a really special date for me. Um, be a really cool thing for me and uh, and, and her family members that I'm that I'm close with. And uh, you know, I want it to be my rebirth. I want it to be the beginning of my second career. I want to come back and uh, and just rip this division apart. 
So first of all, of course, genuine and, and you know sincere condolences to to you for your loss of Haley, for, to your mother, loss of your stepdad. That's all terrible shit. So uh, my and MMA's collective heart goes out to you for that. Um, let me just ask you this, and it involves no details on all this, but I went through a bunch of shit. You know, I, I can't say similar to that, but on that that same level. And at first, everyone gave me the the cliche: "What doesn't kill you makes you stronger." When you come out of the fire, all this bullshit. And oh, I, it actually, it, it pit, yeah, and it really at the time pissed me off. Yeah. Now that I've had a couple of years, I'm not totally buying into those theories. But of course, I mean, I think you eventually <laughs> have to look in. Otherwise, you'll go nuts. See the positive of that, and try to tell me like. Uh, if there's anything that that you, that has helped you, you know, are you doing that? Like using all this to make you stronger, more motivated? Let me know how this has impacted you overall. First of all, that's just the most fucking stupid saying in the world that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It makes no sense at all. I could come over to your house right now and hit you in your kneecaps with a baseball bat, and that shit will not make you stronger. It'll make you a cripple for the rest of your life. That doesn't fuck it. It didn't kill you. Did it make you stronger? No. It weakened you. So, Chewy would never let that shit go down. Chewy would never let that happen, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, man, you hear all these... Uh, this tragedy is nothing but cliche fucking sayings over and over and over that you have to hear from people. And that's... You know, you get tired of it eventually. But, uh, you know... I, there's a lot of things that, uh, that that I that I used to get through, you know, get through the last half. Just got to find an outlet, man. I, you know, fighting was always my outlet, and I didn't really have that. Um, I didn't really have that over the last year or so because of injuries or whatever whatever reasons. You know, I've been going through shit. So, you know, I, I try writing. I try playing music. I try all sorts of things that I can. Uh, really, for me, what makes me feel better about the things I've gone through and that I'm going through is just an ability to express myself, um, and that and that that always kind of helps with the grief a little bit is is being able to share the things that I'm going through with other people. And although sometimes it feels like I'm, you know, I, I've, I've man, I've 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 been on rock bottom at certain times in the last year where I just felt like I had no fucking hope at all, and somehow I'm able to instill hope in others. And I don't know how that happened at the time, but I think that it just goes back to expressing yourself. And, uh, and and making the path a little bit easier for other people, um, you know, it, it sucks. It sucks to be the guy that everybody looks to and say, "Oh, see, my life could be worse," you know. But uh, that's that's what it's come down to, man. And uh, that's what it's come down to for you know a, few, a, a, a good bit of the last year and a half. So um, I'm ready to express myself through my fighting, though. You know, I've I, I've I've expended uh, lots of other creative resources, and I'll continue to do that. I found a lot of things that I think I'm good at and that I like to do, but it's time to it's time to come back home to the cage and uh, and make a statement. All right, obviously I'll come back to fighting here. Two things. You're breaking up, Dallas. Just real quick. First, I'm breaking up. Can you hear me? Hello. I hear you now. Yes. I was going to say just so we don't insult all the friends, family, and loved ones who tried to. You know, to the both of us, whatever kill you doesn't. I, I think I know that their head was in, was in the right place. So for any of those friends, family, to either of us. Well, that's you know. the thing is they don't know what to say. Nobody knows what to say, really. You know, and there's nothing to say. So they say what they, they say what everybody else says. You know? That's what I was going to say. Is really there is nothing to say, and it's tough for them too because they want to help in some way. But it's one of those things where there's there, there's nothing. There's no band aid. There's no words. It. But either way, I think we both understand their hearts were in the right place. With that, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, second one, tell me real quick. You said I've tried playing music. Give oh, yeah. me some rough details. Singing, guitar, DJ, banjo. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, I just I just got a banjo last week actually, but uh, I don't know how to play it yet. Um, I played guitar for years and years, like as a teenager before I found fighting, and um, and uh, I just got back into it in the last year and. You know, I wrote, wrote, write little songs here and there. That I, I mean, really, a lot of a lot of a lot of the writing that I do is for myself. A lot of the writing that I do, whether it's on paper or music or whatever, I, I don't share it. I'm not ready to share it yet, but I will be ready one day. And as for right now, that stuff is just for me and for my peace of mind and my mental health. So, um, you know, I, I I got a YouTube channel where me and my buddy Chad we play covers and stuff. Uh, he's pretty good. He's better than I am. So. Uh, he, he teaches me here and there, along as we play. But uh, that's some stuff that you guys can expect to see from me in the future. Name, what's what's the name of that YouTube channel? It's just Josh the Man. Same thing as my Twitter handle oh, and Instagram. Your own and everything. YouTube. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. All right, yeah. I might give this a look. Um, real quick, musical like tastes. Ask you know, like what kind of shit are you into? 
I like uh, right now in terms of like the music that I play. I like I like playing my acoustic guitar, man. So the people that that uh, that kind of touch me the most through their music is probably Citizen Cope and City and Color, um, stuff like that. You know, mellow, mellow stuff, <laughs> sad shit. <laughs> right, right. I gotcha. Yeah. All right. So tell me real quick. You had two surgeries. Give me the rough specs. What on? How far apart? Oh man. So this was before Haley died. I had. Uh, I tore my meniscus. And this was the second uh, meniscal tear that I had had on the same knee, and I haven't had any problems since then. But this was when I replaced uh, Nick Ring in Boston um, to fight Uriah Hall. Uh, I tore my meniscus, and uh, and and I just went in. And the, there's two different surgeries you can have when you tear your meniscus. You can have a meniscectomy or a meniscal repair. The first one, what I had, was a meniscal repair where they went in, and they tried to sew up the ligament, um, and and hope that it heals correctly. Um, I'm not sure that it ever did heal correctly. Uh, this most recent surgery on the knee, which was last July, they just did a small meniscectomy where they go in and they snip out the part of your uh, meniscus that's torn to prevent it from tearing anymore. I haven't had any problems since then with my knee. Um, so I was slated to fight Kyle uh, Magalhaes on uh, April 19th in Orlando. I was training with Clint Hester, my good buddy from Ultimate Fighter. Um, this was two weeks before the fight. Last round of sparring, last day of hard training, like literally couldn't have been any more of a freak accident. And we're just wrestling around, and um, yeah, I kind of went for a takedown sweep thing and heard several pops in the back of my leg. Um, and then I knew immediately something was really wrong. Uh, and I went and got an MRI that day, and they told me that I had uh, detached my hamstring from my hip bone. A complete avulsion uh, is what they called it, and they, they told me that I was, you know, without a doubt going to need surgery, you know, otherwise I, I'd, I'd be risking mobility for the rest of my life, and uh, that's what I've been dealing with the last four months, man. It's been fucking hell. It's been hell. So I did not know about the most recent, the hamstring. Goo, you gotta, right? got to stay up to date, man. <laughs> well. <laughs> I know you're a busy man. Um, <laughs> but uh, Completely detached. Anyway, so, Oh yeah, completely detached. Uh, which they say, I don't know why. They say that it's that the complete detachment is somehow better than the partial detachment. So I don't know. Um, but but got all that worked out. Uh, screwed my fucking hamstring back onto my uh, my hip bone, so I don't think it'll be coming off again. <laughs> I was in a wheelchair for about a month and crutches for another month, and started walking around and running uh, about. Eight or nine weeks ago, so I'm I'm pretty far in the recovery process. I've been lifting and started kicking things again recently, and uh, going on going on runs. I love running. Started getting my uh, my speed and agility back, and so I'm I'm recovering nicely. Last last couple things I got to do is just start wrestling again and uh, and, and get back on the mat and uh, work my guard game and be ready for all these guys that are wanting to take me down. All right, two more questions for you. When are you going to be back to full time training? Any idea? With Within a couple of weeks. I'm Hopefully. sorry. Say within a few weeks, yeah. Nice. I said within a few weeks. I got you. So now at this point, uh, you know, one question a lot of people say they enjoy the time off. I'm assuming you have not, right? A lot of times, all I've been able to <laughs> learn is a blessing in disguise. I assume that that's a no, no go on your end, yeah? I mean, dude, I'll put it this way, Dallas, is I would have much rather been fighting, without a doubt. But, uh, but there are, I mean... The one thing I can take away from it is, uh, dude, everybody who knows me, everybody who knows, you know, what a uh, what a determined person I am, you know, everything there, everything everybody's saying is, I feel I feel sorry for the next guy you're fighting, and I just kind of sit there and nod and say, wait, wait till you see it. You think you feel bad for him now? Wait until a couple minutes after the fight, and you're really gonna feel sorry for whoever it is that signs that contract, man. I I guarantee that. I promise that. Uh, I've been simmering in my own personal hell for the last 18 months, and I want someone to pay for that shit, you know. So uh, there's definitely there's definitely a lot of motivation there. And, and the other thing I'll say is that a lot of times guys will come off of Ultimate Fighter and uh, and they'll, they'll have their fight at the finale, and you'll see them progress as a fighter from fight to fight over the course of several months. What you're gonna see between my fight now and my last fight with Kevin Casey is a completely different fight. And my coaches and I have been working on things that are going to blow your guys' minds as long as I'm able to execute in the way I want to, you know. Uh, we can we can, we can, can try all the crazy shit we want in practice, but unless I go out there and do it in the cage and do what I need to in the cage, then it doesn't really matter much. But uh, I'm looking to make a statement, and that's an understatement. You know, if there's any... If there's any 
boring ass fighters in the UFC that Joe Silva wants gone. Send them my way. I'll knock them out and send them back. And actually, that was going to be my my closing question. Right now, with you as a fighter, I was going to ask: Are you the standard answer? And it's of course not a bad one. Is I'm working on everything, but uh, I always want to know if someone is really trying to sharpen one particular skill. And it sounds like you're you're doing some different things. So without letting the cat out of the bag entirely, let me know as much as you're comfortable telling me what kind of shit you've been working on. I mean, like striking stuff, guard stuff. Oh yeah, stuff. All, 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 stri all striking stuff, mostly striking stuff. Because like I said, I haven't been able to really wrestle over the course of the you know the past month or two and then even while I was getting ready for the Kyle fight we started doing some some pretty interesting striking concepts and stuff and so I was really starting to have fun with it again uh, before the Kyle fight and I was so I mean I was heartbroken when that uh, when you know when the, when all that shit happened so uh, all that's just gonna carry over I'm gonna parlay it into this fight you guys are gonna see some awesome shit hopefully Beautiful. All right, man. I'm gonna wrap it up. Do you got anything else you want to get out there, close with? Yeah, I just, I just, I started a blog just recently on WordPress. Uh, for anybody who wants to see what kind of writing a uh, <laughs> a UFC fighter is capable of, you can head over there. Go to my YouTube channel. Go follow me on Twitter. All, all that shit. It's all mo most, most all my handles everywhere I go is just my name, Josh Saman. Excellent. All right, everybody, go check out Josh's all that shit YouTube all channel, shit. Twitter yeah. page. Uh, WordPress, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll talk again soon. At the very least, before Jones Cormier, hopefully even a little bit before that, if you get some more details or get a fight lined up and solidified, sound all right? Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to fight. I think uh, I think December six is is going to be the date, guys. It's the date I have my eye on. We'll see when I have an opponent. The last guy I called out was Luke Zakridge. I don't know if they're going to give him to me or not, but he will be the victim if he signs. Excellent. All right, man. Good luck. Thank you very much for coming on again. It's good to see you. Good to catch up with you. I'll see you guys soon. All right. Later, Josh. Thanks.